Okay, so in, in today's lecture, inshallah, we'll continue on with our chapter of goal-oriented modeling. This is the last chapter in, in, the, in the modeling phase or the requirements, we said analysis slash specification phase. Uh, we have a couple of more lectures, one about requirements management and one more about requirements validation. Um, they're not as techy as as this chapter so this chapter is probably like the one of the uh, the last uh, technical chapters anyway so let's do a little bit of a, a recap okay so if we go to this over here now this is to remind you of the notation of the i star okay we said i star is is one of the uh, um, the more common goal oriented modeling languages it and something called cows um, let me just take this out here. Let's do this again. Okay. Uh, let me pull out the pen. Okay. So we said this is what we call an actor. Okay. We're going to have a dotted line. And this, the dotted line inside this, this is the rationale of the actor. Okay. Um, and then on at the bottom over here, this is uh, the objects that can exist other than the actor. Uh, the objects are either a goal or a soft goal. We said the difference between a goal and a soft goal is that a goal is something that you can quantify. You can for sure tell that if you've satisfied or not. Whereas a soft goal, we know it's something that we want, but we don't really have something that we can quantify it with. Like we know we want it, but we can't tell if we achieved it or not. Okay. And then we have a resource. A resource is a thing that you need and that enables you to achieve your goal or could enable you to perform a task. This little symbol here is a task. And a task is something that you do in order to, again, achieve a goal or a soft goal, okay? Between an act and another act, there's a, a set of dependencies. And for each one of them, there's a one-to-one -one mapping with the object that you see on the left-hand side of it, all right? Um, whereas that means that basically an actor could depend on another actor for any one of those, a goal, a task, a resource, or a soft goal. We know the direction of the dependency by actually checking the direction of the letter D. Okay, funny, I know it's not really the most obvious one. Um, finally, the links, okay, you can think of it this way. Um, anything other than a task is broken down with the means to an end link, so you break down a goal by means to an end, okay, uh, 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 or a soft goal, should I say, and even a goal as well. Okay, resources do not get broken down, okay? Um, a resource is just a resource. If you're gonna break down a task, you use that T letter symbol, okay? Finally, the contribution links can link anything together. Doesn't matter what it is, you, is, you're free to use it anywhere you want to. You put a negative or a plus, to specify if it's a, is a positive contribution or is it a negative contribution. Now, negative and positive, they're like uh, support and hinder, okay? So they're not really a hard, um, that, a hard exclusive or, or a hard end either, right? It's just the fact that one exists helps the other one or that the one exists negatively affects the existence of another one, okay? And we said before, I don't know why this showed up as a, as a box, but it's actually a negative sign. All right. Now we said there's two types. Oh, there's two types of diagrams. The first of which is called the strategic dependency model. And with the strategic dependency model, we don't actually show the rationale. Okay, we just show the actors. And the focus of the strategic dependency is to actually show the dependencies that we have in the middle. And this is why it's called the strategic dependency model, okay? For a particular dependency, okay, like this one or, or avoiding accents like that one, we can go into the details by something called a, a strategic rational model. So we got the actor, the same two actors, okay? We have the dependency that we've looked at before, but now we are gonna be looking at the rationale of one particular actor. So this is inside the mind of one particular actor. And as you can see, uh, you know, we have the tasks, they start to be broken down, goals, 
we have the means to an end. We have all sorts of contribution links. And again, this is a negative and this is a negative. All right. We've mentioned before that if we have two negatives right after each other, that means that the first negative is actually a positive to the second thing, to the third element. And positive just keeps adding to the positivity. So if you have um, you know, a box like this and it's, it's negatively affecting something else, which is also negative affecting something else, that means that the, the relationship between this one and this one is a positive link, okay? Whereas if we had a positive and a negative, that means that that positive is actually pushing more into the negative of that one over here. If we have a positive and a positive, that means, again, this is positively affecting this one. Finally, the last situation is, uh, I believe it will be negative plus. That means, again, it would be a negative relationship from the, from the first circle to the last one. All right. So bottom line is the way you need to think about it is um, if you're helping who's helping me, it's good. If you are hurting who's helping me, that's bad. If you're attacking who's hurting me, that's good. If you're helping who's attacking me, that's bad. All right. Very simple as such. All right. Now I'm going to stop here for a second uh, before we get into the other modeling one. Um, I want you to open up Moodle. You'll see an exercise called the I star exercise. That actually used to be an exam question at some point. So uh, I'll leave you a moment to open it up. You'll need to open it up because I'm gonna need to scroll down. And then I'm gonna need to be able to scroll down. So I, I can't actually show the two, the two things at the same time. I, I wish I could show a uh, scroll down, but I can't. So, um, so I'm gonna give you a minute here. And let me pause the recording. All right, so this, like I said before, was a, a question that appeared in, the, in an exam before. Um, okay, so let's begin. It's actually very easy. You, you realize it's actually pretty, pretty simple. <clears throat> um, so the first question says, is the above diagram considered a strategic rational model? How many of you say yes? How many say no? True or false? No, it's not both. It can be either or. Okay, so the answer is true. Okay. Again, the easiest way to think about this is, is to look at the word rational. So rational means what's in the mind of someone. Okay, so it's in the mind here of of the actor. So if it's showing the rationale of the actor, then it's a strategic rational model. If it's only showing, if it's only showing the dependencies, okay, and the focus is only on dependency, this is again another hint when because the other type of diagram is called strategic dependency model. Okay, so the strategic dependency model, think of it if the word dependency is showing in the name of the model, then uh, if the model is all about the dependencies between the different actors, then it would be a strategic dependency model. This is one way, this is what you can do to remind yourself when you're solving that question, if, if, if you ever forget which one was which one. Okay, so if it says rationale, look at the diagram. Is it showing the rationales? Then yes, then it's a strategic rational model. Otherwise, it's a strategic dependency model. Okay, so it's true. All right, so the next question says, List all the direct and indirect tasks required by the meeting initiator. Okay, so this guy over here is the meeting initiator to schedule a meeting. What are the direct and indirect tasks as well? You got to obtain agreement. We got to obtain available dates, and we have merge available dates. Exactly. Okay. And and the word indirect brings in the merge available dates. So if the word indirect didn't exist in the question, then we we'll just look at the direct ones, which would be 
obtain agreement, this one over here, where is the, so it would have been this one over here, and it would have been this one over here only. But because it says indirect as well, then we're gonna have this one included in the answer. All right, very easy, huh? Next up, C, the meeting initiator would like to organize a meeting quickly and with low effort. List the direct task that would negatively affect these two goals of the meeting initiator. All right, so again, the meeting initiator over here, he wants to organize a meeting quickly. So he's gonna to wanna to organize it over here quickly and also with low effort. But there is a task that's negatively affecting both of these soft goals, right? That task would be all right. It's pretty obvious. You gotta look at the negative signs. A uh, schedule a meeting. Exactly, right? This is the direct task that is having a negative here and a negative here on these soft goals, which then is negatively affecting the organizing of the meeting with quick speed and with low effort. This is the direct task that is affecting it, okay? So as you'll notice that the beauty of these type of questions that the answer is in the question, okay? Remember requirements engineering is all about representation. So we're trying to not solve the problem, but actually read the problem correctly, okay? All right, next up, let's go, what was it? Um, D, I think, yeah, D. It says, what are the resources needed by the meeting initiator from the meeting participants? So the meeting initiator, he wants some resources from the meeting participants. What are those resources? All right, so proposed dates, yes. An agreement, yes. Pro proposed date. Now let's hold off on the proposed, but what are the other things? Okay, so we got exclusion dates, yes. Preferred dates, yes, and agreement. So actually uh, not all of those are the resources that we that we that, that the meeting initiated depends on the meeting and participant. One of them actually is going the opposite direction. Now, if you look at the letter D, so this letter D is pointing into this direction from meeting initiator to meeting participant. So we got exclusion dates. Okay, so that's in here. Next up, this letter D again pointing into the right direction. So again, preferred dates, we're gonna pick that up. This letter D is pointing into the same direction. So again, we'll pick up agreement. However, this letter D is pointing from the meeting participant to the initiator. So it's actually the meeting participant who wants the proposed dates from the meeting initiator, okay? So don't fall into this trap, okay? Always look at the letter D and where is that letter D pointing? It's very, very important that you, you do that, okay? So for the answer of this question, had you put in that fourth one, I would have actually deducted marks to make sure that you know what you're doing exactly. Okay, so proposed date would not be correct. The other three would be the one that are correct. Okay, attend meetings. Yes, the dependency is from meeting initiator to participant, but attend meetings is not a resource. Attend meeting is what? It's an action. No, it's, it's, there's no such thing as an action, it's a goal. Okay, so we got four things. Goal, soft goal is the one with the little bubbly thing. Okay, and the goal is the regular with the round edge. This is the task and the square is the resource. Okay, we gotta remember the notation when we're answering these questions. All right, next up. E, the meeting participant would, at would like to, so actually would like to, now there's a little type with, would like to attend the meeting without much effort. What are the goals that would help 
the meeting participant achieve these goals? Let's go back over here. It says that the meeting participant would like, this is the meeting participant, would like to attend the meeting without much effort. So he's gonna attend, well, he wants to attend the meeting here without much effort. What are the goals that would help? All right. So I already got two right answers. Okay. So he wants to attend the meeting. All right. So we're looking all the way down over here as it de gets decomposed to low effort. Okay. And then we're asking what are the goals, or should I say soft goals, that would help the meeting participant achieve it? Well, then we'll pick these two because we have two positive contribution links over there. So it's user friendly, correct? A lot of you got it right. So it's user friendly and the uh, minimum interruption soft goals. Okay? And as you can see, right, minimum interruption didn't actually really, it's not something that we put a number to. What is the minimum interruption? Well, obviously the absolute minimum is zero, uh, but we know interruptions are gonna happen. So how low is low? And then user-friendly, same thing, right? It's still written at a high level. It's not something that we can put black and white, you know, we've achieved it or not. Okay, but it's something we know that we want. All right, last question. Question F, oops, uh, I spilled a little bit too much over here. What does the meeting initiator need from the meeting participant? Yeah, so it'd be to attend the meetings. All right. Now it depends on how that question is answered. I mean, if, if you're just looking at goals, then it's to attend meeting. But if it's if you're looking for everything, okay, then you want to include the resources as well. So it would also include the preferred, sorry, the what's the, the question said the meeting initiator. Oh, if you want to can you can add the resources as well. But if you're asking just for the goals, then it's attend meeting. Okay. The question obviously would specify exactly what is the thing that is required, okay? Or what type of thing is actually required. And so the meeting initiator, at the end of the day, he wants from the meeting participant to please go ahead and attend those meetings, all right? Otherwise, what is the relationship between those two anyways, right? It's, it's to finally get the meeting initiate, it's finally get the meeting participant to attend the meeting that was set by the meeting initiator. Doctor, it's the opposite. What is exactly the opposite? It says, what is what does the meeting initiator want from the meeting participant? No, 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 Baba, it's actually the dependency is, is going from the meeting initiator to the participant. Okay. So I'm initiating the meeting. Think of it this way: I'm initiating the meeting. My goal is the people that I want to invite that they actually do attend the meeting at the end. Okay. So if I'm the meeting initiator, my success is getting the meeting participants to attend the meetings. Does that make sense, Lubella? All right. The question, what does the meeting participant? No, 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 Lubella, the, the, the question is not like this. If you, if you read the question at the bottom here again, okay, it's actually the opposite. What does the meeting initiator need from the meeting participant? Okay, so you have it, meeting participant needs from the meeting initiator. All right, so it's the opposite. Um, oh, and is, are you serious? I mean, the actual, the actual document that's up there, it's the opposite? Hmm, well, that's interesting. That must have been a typo. Well, anyway, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it, I mean, I'll tell you two different actors and basically you look at the direction, the opposite direction of the dependencies and you just list them down. If it's asking for the goals, you put down the goals. If it's asking for the resources, you put down the resources. It could actually be also tasks and it could also be soft goals 
as well. All right. So it's weird that the two documents are a bit different here, but I must have changed them at some point and then I decided to change it back. But it's not, it's not really that big of a deal. Now, another type of question that you may get, okay, we're not going to be solving that other type of question here, but let me do the screen share first. Uh, okay. So the other exercise is called the, the I star drawing. Okay. Now, in the I star drawing, you actually get to um, draw an entire I star diagram from scratch. Okay, it sounds daunting, but it's not really that big of a deal. Okay, so the question is going to come in from that format. Okay, it's going to say, um, here's your actors. So it's pretty obvious where the actors are. Now, it's going to say, what's the rationale of the student or the first actor? All right, you read it. And these are the things that go in the dotted line, okay? The rationale of the student. So, you know, the little bubble that surrounds the student circle, the student actor, everything in here is what you're gonna go inside. And then you'll see highlighted the things that would be goals or soft goals or a tasks or whatever, okay? Here is the rationale of the other actor, which is the professor, okay? And again, uh, you'll see the rationale of the professor. Do we need papers? What do you mean do you need? I mean, I'll give you white papers, of course, to actually draw. I'll give you a space in the question to draw. I'm not sure if this is your question, Lubeva, but... Um, so the professor had, you know, will say that they had, no, I mean for... No, we're not gonna actually solve the exercise now. Um, but I'm explaining how the exercise goes, okay? So again, we have the actors, it's gonna tell you the actors, it's gonna tell you the rationale of each actor, okay? So this is the student, then followed by this is the rationale of the professor. So that goes inside the circle, the dashed cloud of the professor. And then finally, it's gonna tell you the dependencies between the two actors, okay? And this is the part that goes in the middle. So if we go back again here, okay? Okay, this would be your actor, this would be the other actor, so a student, a professor. What goes into the rationale of the student goes in here, that middle part. What goes into the rationale of the, uh, the, the professor goes in here. And then the part that says the dependency between the two actors is what goes in the middle over here, okay? Now, there is obviously a little bit of um, subjectivity when you're reading it, okay? It's not always hardcore you know, what is a soft goal, what is a task. A lot of these sometimes can get interpreted as two things. I do have a little bit of tolerance, obviously, when I'm reading your answers to see if that could be a viable or a possible answer. So it's not like there's a one answer that fits all. For, um, for this question, I want you to solve it so you get prepared for your quiz. Uh, at a later point before the quiz, I'll actually post the answer. But again, just like everything else, it's not going to help you to just look at the answer and reverse engineer like the question for me. Okay, I want you to do the opposite. Okay, I want you to be able to read the question and be able to draw the answer. So please, 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 when you do look at the at the answer, please do that on, only after you've solved the exercise. Okay, guys. All right, so let's move on to, we're going back again to the fundamentals here, okay. All right, so we said that the other type of goal-oriented modeling language is called CAUS, okay. A CAUS has a number of complementary views. You got something called the goal model, the obstacle model, the object agent model. But right? the one we're gonna focus on is the goal and the object model, sorry, the goal and the agent model. And the idea of CAUS is very similar to I star. Okay. Um, it has something called the behavior goal, which is equivalent to the goal of the I star. Soft goal, again, exactly the same as the soft goal of the I star. And the differences between them is exactly the same as well. Finally, what, what is referred to here as agent, because remember, every, I, every modeling language has its own terminology. What is referred to as agent is actually your actor. Okay, 
with the relationship you have end decomposition you have alternative decomposition i.e an or decomposition then you have potential conflict all right so there's a hindrance between two different goals or a soft goal on another goal there is no uh, positive influence so just to, so the notation only comes with the potential conflict finally um you have something called a responsibility assignment and this is similar to the association that exists between a use case and an actor okay so the responsibility assignment it connects an agent with a goal or a soft goal all right all right so it's already covered all of this i want to go now to the notation all right so over here on this side this is the objects all right so the first one is the goal you can see it's a I think it's called a parallelogram, all right? And the soft goal is, is dotted to show that it's actually soft. Finally, the agent, which is the actor, is shown as a, um, I believe it's called a hexagon. I always get mixed up in the name of the, the, the shapes, okay? So this over here is the responsibility assignment link. It's, you'll see the circles. It's actually a, quite a bit of a, a stable in the notation of cows. All right, so the, the responsibility assignment, it joins a goal with an actor, or should I say an agent, all right? And then we have the potential conflict, it joins two different goals, could also join soft goals as well, and you'll see that little thunderbolt thing in the middle, all right? And then finally, you get the end, and you got the uh, alternatives. Now, um, this over here is what we call an alternative, and this over here is what we call an or. I want to step out here for a second to explain something. Uh, let me open up just the whiteboard. Just needs a moment to load. I haven't done the screen share just yet, but just give me a moment. All right. So the, 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 the end, when we're doing the ends, it goes something as such, right? So this is one of the goals, okay? Then you'll have the circle. The circle is always there. If the lines are going out of the same circle, okay? Okay, then this is what we refer to as the end the fact that it's coming out of the same circle, okay? This over here, is what we call an OR, okay? Because the arrows are disconnected and the circles are disconnected too, okay? So this over here would be and or, okay? So over here, if we have A, B, and C, so the main goal M is, is A and B and C. And over there, if the main goal is M, then M is equal to B to A or B. Now, if you have a diagram like this, which combines both, uh, um, let's just go something like that. This is my M. Let me see if you're paying attention over here. Okay. And excuse my artistic skills. They're not really the best, but I do what I can as much as I can. All right. So the way I'm reading this is that we're either going with the one side of the yellow or the other side of the yellow actually let's let's do something let's do something different here okay all right so m is equal to the yellow or the red if you happen to go through the red then it's A and B. And if you happen to go to the yellow, it's C 
and the D. All right, does that make sense for you guys? Sounds good. Okay. And then you can do all sorts of combinations that you would uh, you could think of. All right, let's do an exercise on this, all right? Now, again, open up your Moodles and you'll find an exercise called the Gauss exercise. And again, that was actually an exam question at some point. And you're supposed to find the Gauss exercise. It looks something as such. All right. Now you can get a question. This is an and or graph and it's asking you to convert that into a, a, a cow's diagram. All right. And it's very simple. All right. And again, I'll leave that up to you to do at your own time and, and get ready for the for, for, for the quizzes with it. You do one, it's like you've done everyone, right? Again, I will be posting the answer to this question a little bit before the quiz comes along. And um, once again, please, please, please do try to solve the question before you actually look at the solution and not just look at the solution right away. All right, guys. Um, okay. All right, so um, let's take a look. I want to go back again over here. Yeah. So let's just take a look at some examples of the cow's diagram. If I'm reading this diagram over here, I have two soft goals. They have a conflict with each other. All right. Uh, so if you want to have a short traveling time, I, I'm going to have to consume a lot of fuel. If I want to have low fuel consumption, then I'm going to have to increase my traveling time. In either case, I want to have, I want to be able to avoid traffic jam. Traffic jams helps both cases. Okay. So if I avoid traffic jam, I'm going to shorten my traveling time and also going to lower my fuel consumption. Okay. In order to avoid the traffic jams, I have to do two things. Okay, detect traffic jams on route. And also I have to be able to recalculate a route after detecting a traffic jam. So this is an and, all right? And then at the bottom over here, we have detect the traffic jam on route. In order to do it, I can do it in either two ways. So I can do it with receiving traffic messages or I can do it by allowing the driver to enter the traffic jams himself, and this would be an or. And as you can see, both of these would be would have been redundant, okay? So one is actually doing the job of another one, and this is why it's not an and, it's just an or, all right? It also could be an or if one of them would be enough, right? If you don't have to do both of them, then it could be also be an or. So it's one or more, all right? Even if they're redundant, all right? Is that bottom half of, of the diagram, this, this diagram over here, the bottom half is actually this one over there. And for the driver to enter the traffic jams on route, I have a responsibility assignment with an agent and that agent is my user, racing, user interface control. Could actually be the driver as well. And receiving of the traffic messages is done by the traffic message reader, okay? Or again, like I said, obviously any other actor that uh, depending on the, the type of question that you actually will be getting. All right. Okay, I want to stop this over here. Let me pause the recording. We get into some details about requirements management, but as you'll notice later on in your fourth year when you take your uh, software project management course is that um, there's obviously some overlap because project management obviously deals with the management of the entire project and requirements engineering phase is a phase inside the entire project. So the, the management of requirements itself is, uh, is obviously encompassed within the general 
project management concept, but you'll notice that some of these concepts will repeat. The project management course, you're gonna be taking two years from now. So you probably be forgetting what I actually gonna to say today, but hopefully it will spring back into your memory as, as you're taking that other course as well. So um, in, in, in management in general, one of the, um, the main things that we focus on is, is obviously resources and time. So time even, so we're looking usually at schedules, the tasks, how long are these tasks are gonna take, the dependencies between those tasks, and then the individual is gonna be working on it. And with it, I can figure out the, the, the length of the project and also the, uh, the what, we, what we call the critical path, which is the, the shortest time that the project could be completed in, all right? So our focus here in, in requirements management is a bit different. We're not looking at the schedule. We're not looking at, um, at who's gonna be doing what per se, because that's just generic project management concept. We're gonna be focusing on the impact and the links and the traceability matrices that exist between different artifacts and others, all right? All right. Um, now, managing requirements engineering artifacts, artifacts could be your SRS document, could be your, uh, you know, certain manuals, interview notes, use case model, user stories, system context diagram, all right? Uh, it's, it's very, very challenging because there could be so many of them, all right? And not only that there's so many of them, and a lot of them actually result into the creation of others. Naturally, when the dependency exists, if one do change, it will affect the others as well, okay? So remember, at the beginning of the course, we did system context diagrams, and then we followed that up with, with use case diagrams. And we saw that there's a relationship between them and how the actors are supposed to be the same and consistent and so on, all right? Now, there is obviously a dependency between those two diagrams. More specifically, the use case diagram actually depends on the system context diagram. And another way of saying this is that we, we started off with the system context diagram and we elaborated on it to create the use case diagram. So a change that would occur in the system context diagram would also affect the use case diagram or may affect the use case diagram in case one of the actors that existed in the system context diagram actually changed. So it, that has to be reflected on the use case diagram. In order to, to, to manage all of this, we create what we call traceability links, okay? So, uh, Let's take a look at that. We have to establish those traceabilities and we establish them in the form of a matrix. Okay, so the goal of management requirements is to do a number of things. First of all, is to observe the context to detect context changes, manage the execution of requirements engineering activities, and obviously managing the requirements engineering artifacts. Okay, now let me just write this down here. Okay, so if this is my system, the first point is saying, watch out for the context and see if it's changing. Because if it changes, then it's gonna change what's inside the system, okay? The second one deals with the requirements engineering activities. For example, you've done an interview, you know, followed by a questionnaire, followed by blah, 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 right? It could be anything that you're dealing with, any logistical things, okay? So this takes, for example, two days, this takes three days, this takes one day. Okay, uh, some, of the, some things could be done in parallel. So this also takes another one day as well. This is generic project management though. So we're not gonna be focusing much on that second point too much because you'll deal with this in your project management course. This is just the management of the activities, who's gonna be doing what, how much time does each one, uh, each one of these tasks require? What is the slack, something called the slack? And again, these are concepts that you will be covering quite extensively in your project management course, so not right now. 
Okay, the third one is the actual artifacts. Okay, so here I am, this is my SRS document. I got the system context diagram. I got the use case diagram, maybe even a misuse case diagram and there's dependencies between them. Okay, so managing the artifacts, the evolution, all right, it's also part of what we do in requirements management in general, okay? So um, the management of requirements engineering activities, it aims to monitor, control, and adjust the planned workflow of elicitation, documentation, negotiation, validation activities, okay? So these are the four main things that exist in the requirements engineering phase. And again, not too much of interest for us because that you cover as you do in project management. What we're really focused on in this particular course is what we call the traceability, requirements traceability, okay? So requirements traceability refers to the ability to describe and follow the life of requirements in both forwards navigation and backwards navigations to its origin, okay? Um, and, and through all periods of ongoing refinement and iteration of these phases. Now, mainly our requirements engineering phase is in the middle over here, okay? There is certain things that also affect my requirements artifacts, okay? Because obviously the requirements artifacts that I'm gonna create, I'm not gonna create that from thin air, okay? So here it could be my interviews, could be videotapes, could be uh, questionnaires, okay? And all of those affect my creation of my requirements engineering artifacts. What are the requirements engineering artifacts? You have like, for example, system context models, use case diagrams, misuse case diagrams, and so on. What are the successor artifacts? Okay, what happens, we said before that requirements leads to design, right? Which then leads to uh, implementation, which leads to testing, okay? So the successor artifacts would be my design and anything else that my requirements affect. My requirements artifacts should actually be driving everything else that is created. Okay, so I can create a diagram, for example, like a use case, sorry, not a use case, a class diagram. Okay, or I could have created an activity diagram or a sequence diagram, okay, or a stage chart diagram. All of this you've been doing in the lab. I'm aware that all of this you do in the lab, but again, any change in here might affect one or more of what's going on over there, all right? What happens, on this side, it's called pre-traceability links. What happens on that side, okay, this, this is my R, it's called post-traceability links, okay? This would be, think of it as my system. This would be my context of the system, okay? So if anything in my context changes, I gotta watch out to make sure that my requirements artifacts are up to date. And when they change, I'm expecting that will also have an effect on uh, the, the, the up-to-dateness of the successor artifacts. Right. And again, this is just saying what I've been, I've been doing before, okay? And like I said, it's one thing I wanna mention here, but the post-traceability, it's not necessarily that the R affects the D only, okay? Because if you do a change in the design, it's probably gonna, uh, trigger a change in the implementation, which is also gonna trigger a change in my testing, which triggers a lot of other things, okay? So just one change over here causes a change downstream, okay? And the change downstream is actually much, much bigger, all right? But all of these traceability matrices that we have, okay, with the pre and the post, it makes sure that the system and what it, actually exists in it and the functionality that are actually implemented and delivered and deployed to the customers are a reflection of what they actually need, all right? So it's not that the system is doing something and it's, there's a disconnect between it and what the outside world is asking for, all right? So again, this is more details of the previous diagram that I was explaining, all right? 
Now, when we get to write down the traceabilities, okay, uh, any artifact that it could be a, a, a specific requirement, could be a goal, okay, it could be a detailed design, a high level design, there's links between them, all right? And I can write down any type of link between them. So this, this traceability relationships, uh, the generic, you can put anything you want. Okay, it could be supports, it could be refines, could be um, redundancy and so on. And, and again, we've covered these sort of notions and concepts before when we looked at goal oriented modeling. So we're not gonna be covering them again over here because just a repetition of what I said before. Uh, but basically the most important thing is that there is a relationship that I need to uh, um, watch out for that they exist again. Some of them could be related to condition. So saying if you have A, then you can't have B, and if you have B, you can't have A. Some of them could be related to content, meaning for example, what's inside A is really the same as what's inside B, okay? Some of them could be related to abstraction, as in, for example, A is a general concept of what's in B. Some of them could be related to evolution. Evolution means we started off with A and then we moved on to B. So A and B are two different things, but it's now that we don't have A, we're gonna have B instead. So it evolved into being a B. And then finally, the last one, it says miscellaneous. So basically, if it doesn't fit in any of the first four, you can put anything that you actually want, all right? And I'll leave that up to you to read at your own time. They're actually pretty simple and they're all concepts that we've covered before. Here's the part that I really wanna focus on. Now, when you have a, a specific requirement as such, it has a code, okay? And that happens by the way in the real world, all different artifacts that get an ID and then you'll have a link between them, okay? So R217 is linked with R311. The type of relationship is called conflicts. As you can see, there's no specific notation that exists for that specifically, but there's so many tools that exist about this. By the way, so if you have something, I think HP has something called the, the total quality center, and then you would write down the requirement. You write down something like R2, and then you, you right click on it, you go to properties, and then you can choose from the list of other artifacts that exists Okay, you, you can choose R311 and you link it, okay? And you can say which one depends on which one, okay? Now, later on, the, the beauty of this is, is that if you do make a change over here, it will tell you these are the other ones that are affected by it, okay? So this is what we call impact analysis, impact analysis, all right? So if I have an artifact over here, which affects, okay, or should I, I shall do the opposite. This, I have an artifact over here. Depending on it is this artifact over here, which depending on it, that artifact, and which depends on it, that artifact. A change happened over here, impacts this one, this one, and this one, and so on, okay? And likely, uh, same, similarly, if I have this artifact over here and depending on it, something else, okay? Um, a change that would happen here would trigger something to happen over here. Okay, but it wouldn't trigger, those won't be affected, the other ones that I just circled, they're not impacted by the change that happened at the bottom over there, okay? Because there's no link between them, okay? So whatever I do at this part of the diagram has absolutely no effect on this side over here, or even actually this one for that matter, all right? Similarly, a change that happens over here doesn't affect what I have at the bottom here. So it doesn't affect this one over there and doesn't obviously affect this one either, okay? Uh, one thing I should make clear is that traceability links doesn't have to exist just between pre and post phases, like between requirements and design and also between requirements and what's happening outside. It could exist between two different elements inside the same inside the same uh, uh, phase, okay? So within the requirements engineering phase, I can have two entities that there's a link between them. 
Okay, and then there's a link between this one and an entity that exists in the design phase. Okay, which then has a link between that and the implementation phase. And in the outside world, there's an entity over here that is a link between it and the documents that's inside. So linking could be within the same phase, okay, in addition to post and pre as well. All right. We can do this, a lot of, a lot of software tools do this um, by just creating hyperlinks and so on. One thing you can do, you can also create a table, it's called the traceability matrix, okay? And on this side, we write down the sources. The top one is the artifacts. And um, I can put anything that I want in these boxes, including X if I want. So I can just say that scenario one, is affecting goal one, meaning a change in scenario one would affect goal one, all right? Um, oh, sorry, it's a satisfies. Okay, so, so the way I'm reading it here, so this is a satisfies. So S1 satisfies goal one, okay? So obviously, again, and a change in goal in the goal would actually cause a change into my scenario itself. Okay, if I don't want to put X, I want to be specific about the type of of dependency. Okay, so if so, if if it's not all the same, so over here was all the same because all of them were satisfies. Okay, but I can put down say satisfies based on conflicts, anything that I want. And I'll just say basically, uh, for example, scenario two is based on G1. Okay, scenario five uh, satisfies G2. All right. I can show the same exact information here in a visual format. All right. <clears throat> and uh, the way I'm reading it, so this would be my source. This would be my target. Okay. So G11 would have been shown at the top of my table. And this over here, let's call this S1. So S1 will be over here. This is a satisfies relationship. Okay, so I'm gonna put down in this box, satisfied, okay? And again, like I was saying, this is not a formal notation like the case was with goal-oriented modeling or system context diagrams or use cases or all the other things that we've looked at before. It's, it's a management thing, but the important thing in all of this, whether you're doing it by table or whether you're doing it by a diagram is that, um, is that you establish these dependencies, okay? And as you can see from this diagram, the dependencies could actually be quite complex. A dependency could be complex. So one change somewhere would affect other things, all right? So if this one depends on or satisfies that one, that means that a change over here would trigger a change over there. Okay, and so on and so forth. Now, let's take another example over here. because so you can get this question in, 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 our, in our exams, okay? okay? So this was my goal. I've created, you know, S1 or a requirement one over here. S1 was there to satisfy this goal. R1 was there to satisfy S1. So obviously a change in here, would cause a change in S1, which then will cause a change in R1. So when I ask you in the exam, I will say, if a change happens to G, okay, and you need to perform impact analysis, what are the other artifacts that are impacted? You would tell me it's S1 and S, uh, uh, um, it's S1 and, and um, what's it called? 
uh, R1. Okay, I just, my brain just froze here for a second. All right. So is this clear, guys, for everyone? So as it is the case always, by the way, in, in, in management, all the concepts are actually simple. Okay, requirements management is not, or even project management is not in itself a very technical thing. And, in, 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 you know, like, like if, if you're talking about say math and science, it's not really like that. There's a bit of an artistic skill for it where the experience of the manager does influence the success or failure of the project quite heavily. And the thing about management is that it's very related to organization. And so proper management deals with you being properly organized, okay? And all of these diagrams, these traceability matrix is, is organizing this for us. It's being aware and having an organization and uh, organization structure between our artifacts so that when something does change, when something does change, we can actually see what else is being affected by it. All right, guys. And again, yes, yes, there is. Um, it's already posted on Ask and You Shall Receive. There's a question about this that exists in the on Moodle. You can go ahead and actually answer that one. We don't have to wait for the next lecture. And I'm going to leave that up to you to solve. And again, I will be posting the answer to that exercise on. Uh, um, I'll move it pretty soon. So, but let me let me just show you what I mean here. I wanna just give me a moment. Where is it? Okay, there we go. All right. So this could be a typical question that you can get. Okay, here's the traceability framework, draw the traceability diagram. Okay, so that means we'll go from this and you create the equivalent from it over here. By the way, it's the same information. So the answer is already in the question or uh, where's the uh, document? Nope, no, no, that's not it. Uh, you can get a diagram like this one over here and it's ask you to go ahead and create the uh, the matrix for it. Okay, so the table. Okay, and you'll be given like a nice grid table like this one, not that you feel compelled to have to use all of it. You can just use whatever it is that you need from it. Okay, and the question would come into one of these two forms. Okay, the last question that can, can affect, that, that can come is, is I'll ask you if a change happened to G2, what else would be affected? So in this case would be S6, it would be S3, be S4, and also S5. If a change happens to G1, the only thing that is affected is S2, Okay, S1 would not be affected because the dependency is actually going into the other direction, all right? And again, the laws of dependency, the laws of the direction of the arrows of dependency is always the same. Who depends on who is where the arrow is pointing. If I depend on you, if I depend on you I'm going to be pointing to you. If I don't depend on you or you the one who depends on me, you are going to be pointing at me, okay? So if I depend on you, F1 calls on F2, means F1 depends on F2. If a change happens in F2, that affects F1, but vice versa is not the case, all right? Since F2 does not really care about F1, all right, then a change that happens in F1 doesn't affect F2, okay? So think about it this way, like if F1 is the average function and F2 is the sum, right? Uh, if I change the way I calculate the sum, that obviously affects my average, okay? But if I change the way I calculate the average, that doesn't affect the way I calculate my sum. All right, guys? So that's gonna be it for today. 
Um, next lecture, we're gonna look at the management of change. All right, so we looked at establishing the traceability framework, but what happens when a change actually does occur? How do we deal with it? How do we handle it? That will be the topic of the next lecture. And with that, you'll be ready for your quiz on, on Thursday, April the 8th. All right, so that's it for today, guys. Um, I'll see you on Monday, inshallah.